Short Mystery and Suspense Collection 15 The Absence of Mr. Glass by G. K. Chesterton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Consulting Rooms of Dr. Orion Hood the eminent criminologist and specialist in certain moral disorders, lay along the seafront at Scarborough in a series of very large and well-lighted French windows which showed the North Sea like one endless outer wall of blue-green marble. In such a place, the sea had something of the monotony of a blue-green dado, for the chambers themselves were ruled throughout by a terrible tidiness, not unlike the terrible tidiness of the sea. It must not be supposed that Dr. Hood's apartments excluded luxury or even poetry. These things were there, in their place, but one felt that they were never allowed out of their place. Luxury was there. There stood upon a special table eight or ten boxes of the best cigars, but they were built upon a plan so that the strongest were always near the wall and the mildest near the window. A tantalus containing three kinds of spirits, all of a liqueur excellence, stood always on this table of luxury. But the fanciful have asserted that the whisky, brandy and rum seemed always to stand at the same level. Poetry was there. A left-hand corner of the room was lined with as complete a set of English classics as the right hand could show of English and foreign physiologists. But if one took a volume of Chaucer or Shelley from that rank, his absence irritated the mind like a gap in a man's front teeth. One could not say the books were never read, probably they were, but there was a sense of their being chained to their places like the Bibles in old churches. Dr. Hood treated his private bookshelf as if it were a public library, and if this strict scientific intangibility steeped even the shelves laden with lyrics and ballads, and the tables laden with drink and tobacco, it goes without saying that yet more of such heathen holiness protected the other shelves that held the specialist's library, and the other tables that sustained the frail and even fairy-like instruments of chemistry or mechanics. Dr. Hood paced the length of his string of apartments, bounded, as the boys' geographies say, on the east by the North Sea, and on the west by the serried ranks of his sociological and criminologist library. He was clad in an artist's velvet, but with none of an artist's negligence. His hair was heavily shot with grey, but growing thick and healthy. His face was lean, but sanguine and expectant. Everything about him and his room indicated something at once rigid and restless, like that great northern sea by which, on pure principles of hygiene, he had built his home. Fate, being in a funny mood, pushed the door open and introduced into those long, strict, sea-flanked apartments one who was perhaps the most startling opposite of them and their master. In answer to a curt but civil summons, the door opened inwards, and there shambled into the room a shapeless little figure which seemed to find its own hat and umbrella as unmanageable as a mass of luggage. The umbrella was a black and prosaic bundle long past repair, the hat a broad curved black hat, clerical but not common in England. The man was the very embodiment of all that is homely and helpless. The doctor regarded the newcomer with a restrained astonishment, not unlike that he would have shown if some huge but obviously harmless sea beast had crawled into his room. The newcomer regarded the doctor with that beaming but breathless geniality which characterises a corpulent charwoman who has just managed to stuff herself into an omnibus. It is a rich confusion of social self-congratulation and bodily disarray. His hat tumbled onto the carpet, his heavy umbrella slipped between his knees with a thud. He reached after one and ducked after the other, but with an unimpaired smile on his round face, spoke simultaneously as follows. My name is Brown. Uh, pray excuse me. I I've come about that business of the McNabs. I have heard you often help people out of such troubles. Uh, pray excuse me if I am wrong. By this time he had sprawlingly recovered the hat and made a an odd bobbing little bow over it as if setting everything quite right. 
I can hardly understand you, replied the scientist in a cold intensity of manner. I fear you have mistaken the chambers. I am Dr. Hood, and my work is almost entirely literary and educational. It is true that I have sometimes been consulted by the police in cases of peculiar difficulty and importance, but... Oh, uh, this is of the greatest importance, broke in the little man called Brown. Uh, why, her uh, mother won't let them get engaged. And he leaned back in his chair in radiant rationality. The brows of Dr. Hood were drawn down darkly, but the eyes under them were bright with something that might be anger or might be amusement. And still, he said, I do not quite understand. You see, they want to get married, said the man with the clerical hat. Maggie McNabb and young Todd Hunter want to get married. Now, uh, what could be more important than that? The great Orion Hood's scientific triumphs had deprived him of many things. Some said of his health, others of his god. But they had not wholly despoiled him of his sense of the absurd. At the last plea of the ingenuous priest, a chuckle broke out of him from inside, and he threw himself into an armchair in an ironical attitude of the consulting physician. Mr. Brown, he said gravely, it is quite fourteen and a half years since I was personally asked to test a personal problem. Then it was the case of an attempt to poison the French president at a Lord Mayor's banquet. It is now, I understand, a question of whether some friend of yours called Maggie is a suitable fiancé for some friend of hers called Todd Hunter. Well, Mr. Brown, I am a sportsman. I will take it on. I will give the McNabb family my best advice, as good as I gave the French Republic and the King of England. No, better. Fourteen years better. I have nothing else to do this afternoon. Tell me your story. The little clergyman called Brown thanked him with unquestionable warmth, but still with a queer kind of simplicity. It was rather as if he were thanking a stranger in a smoking room for some trouble in passing the matches than as if he were, as he was, practically thanking the curator of Kew Gardens for coming with him into a field to find a four-leafed clover. With scarcely a semicolon after his hearty thanks, the little man began his recital. I told you my name was Brown. Well, that's that's a fact, and I'm the priest of the little Catholic church I dare say you've seen beyond those straggly streets where the town ends towards the north. In the last and straggliest of those streets, which runs along the sea like a sea wall, there was a very honest but rather sharp-tempered member of my flock, a widow called McNabb. She has one daughter, and she lets lodgings, and between her and the daughter, and between her and the lodgers, well, I dare say there is a, a great deal to be said on both sides. At present, she has only one lodger, the young man called Todd Hunter, but he has given more trouble than all the rest, for he wants to marry the young woman of the house. And the young woman of the house? asked Dr. Hood, with huge and silent amusement. What does she want? Why, she wants to marry him, cried Father Brown, sitting up eagerly. That is just the awful complication. It is indeed a hideous enigma, said Dr. Hood. This young James Todd Hunter, continued the cleric, is a very decent man, so far as I know, but nobody knows very much. He is a bright, brownish little fellow, agile like a monkey, clean-shaven like an actor, and obliging like a born courtier. He seems to have quite a pocket full of money, but nobody knows what his trade is. Mrs. McNabb, therefore, being of a pessimistic turn, is quite sure that it is something dreadful and probably connected with dynamite. This dynamite must be of a shy and noiseless sort, for the poor fellow only shuts himself up for several hours of the day and studies something behind a locked door. He declares his privacy is temporary and justified and promises to explain before the wedding. That is all anyone knows for certain, but Mrs. McNabb will tell you a great deal more than even she is certain of. You know how the tales grow like grass on such a patch of ignorance as that? 
There are tales of two voices heard talking in the room, though when the door is opened, Todd Hunter is always found alone. There are tales of a mysterious tall man in a silk hat who once came out of the sea mists and apparently out of the sea, stepping softly across the sandy fields and through the small back garden at twilight till he was heard talking to the lodger at his open window. The colloquy seemed to end in a quarrel. Todd Hunter dashed down his window with violence, and the man in the high hat melted into the sea fog again. This story is told by the family with the fiercest mystification, but I really think Mrs. McNabb prefers her own original tale. That the other man, or whatever it is, crawls out every night from the big box in the corner which is kept locked all day. You see, therefore, how this sealed door of Todd Hunter's is treated as the gate of all the fancies and monstrosities of the thousand and one nights. And yet there is the little fellow in his respectable black jacket, as punctual and innocent as a parlour clock. He pays his rent to the tick. He is practically a teetotaler. He is tirelessly kind with the younger children and can keep them amused for a day on end. And last, and most urgent of all, he has made himself equally popular with the eldest daughter, who is ready to go to church with him tomorrow. A man warmly concerned with any large theories has always a relish for applying them to any triviality. The great specialist, having condescended to the priest's simplicity, condescended expansively. He settled himself with comfort in his armchair and began to talk in the tone of a somewhat absent-minded lecturer. Even in a minute instance, it is best to look first at the main tendencies of nature. A particular flower may not be dead in early winter, but the flowers are dying. A particular pebble may never be wetted with the tide, but the tide is coming in. To the scientific eye, all human history is a series of collective movements, destructions or migrations, like the massacre of flies in winter or the return of birds in spring. Now, the root fact in all history is race. Race produces religion. Race produces legal and ethical wars. There is no stronger case than that of the wild, unworldly and perishing stock which we commonly call the Celts of whom your friends, the McNabs, are specimens. Small and swarthy, and of this dreamy and drifting blood, they accept easily the superstitious explanation of any incidents, just as they still accept, you will excuse me for saying, that superstitious explanation of all incidents which you and your church represent. It is not remarkable that such people, with the sea moaning behind them, and the church... Excuse me again, a droning in front of them should put fantastic features into what are probably plain events. You, with your small parochial responsibilities, see only this particular Mrs. McNabb, terrified of this particular tale of two voices and a tall man out of the sea. But the man with the scientific imagination sees, as it were, the whole clans of McNabb scattered over the whole world in its ultimate average as uniform as a tribe of birds. He sees thousands of Mrs. McNabbs in thousands of houses dropping their little drop of morbidity into the teacups of their friends. He sees, before the scientist could conclude his sentence, another and more impatient summons sounded from without, someone with swishing skirts was marshalled hurriedly down the corridor, and the door opened on a young girl, decently dressed but disordered, and red-hot with haste. She had sea-blown blonde hair, and would have been entirely beautiful if her cheekbones had not been, in the Scotch manner, a little high in relief as well as in colour. Her apology was almost as abrupt as a command. "'I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir,' she said, "'but I had to follow Father Brown at once. It's nothing less than life or death.' Father Brown began to get to his feet in some disorder. Why, uh, what has happened, Maggie? he said. James has been murdered, for all that I can make out, answered the girl, still breathing hard from her rush. That man Glass has been with him again. I heard him talking through the door quite plain, two separate voices, for James speaks low with a burr, and the other voice was high and quavery. That man Glass, repeated the priest in some perplexity. I know his name is Glass. 
answered the girl in great impatience. I heard it through the door. They were quarrelling about money, I think, for I heard James say again and again, that's right, Mr. Glass, or no, Mr. Glass, and then two or three, Mr. Glass. But we're talking too much. You must come at once, and there may be time yet. But time for what? asked Dr. Hood, who had been studying the young lady with marked interest. What is there about this Mr. Glass and his money troubles that should impel such urgency? I tried to break down the door and couldn't, answered the girl shortly. Then I ran back to the backyard and managed to climb into the window sill that looks into the room. It was all dim and seemed to be empty, but I swear I saw James lying huddled up in a corner as if he were dragged or strangled. This is very serious, said Father Brown, gathering his errant hat and umbrella and standing up. In point of fact, I was just putting your case before this gentleman, and his view has been largely altered, said the scientist gravely. I do not think this young lady is so Celtic as I had supposed. As I have nothing else to do, I will put on my hat and stroll downtown with you. In a few minutes, all three were approaching the dreary tale of the McNabb Street. The girl with the stern and breathless stride of the mountaineer, the criminologist with a lounging grace, which was not without a certain leopard-like swiftness, and the priest at an energetic trot entirely devoid of distinction. The aspect of this edge of town was not entirely without justification for the doctor's hints about desolate moods and environments. The scattered houses stood farther and farther apart in a broken string along the seashore, the afternoon was closing with a premature and partly lurid twilight. The sea was of an inky purple and murmuring ominously. In the scrappy backyard of the McNabs, which ran down towards the sand, two black, barren-looking trees stood up like demon hands held up in astonishment, and as Mrs. McNab ran down the street to meet them with lean hands similarly spread and her fierce face in shadow, she was a little like a demon herself. The doctor and the priest made scant reply to her shrill reiterations of her daughter's story with more disturbing details of her own, into the divided vows of vengeance against Mr. Glass for murdering, and against Mr. Todhunter for being murdered, and against the latter for having dared to want to marry her daughter, and for not having lived to do it. They passed through the narrow passage in the front of the house until they came to the lodger's door at the back, and there Dr. Hood, with the trick of an old detective, put his shoulder sharply to the panel and burst in the door. It opened on a scene of silent catastrophe. No one seeing it, even for a flash, could doubt that the room had been the theatre of some thrilling collision between two or perhaps more persons. Playing cards lay littered across the table or fluttered about the floor as if the game had been interrupted. Two wine glasses stood ready for wine on a side table, but a third lay smashed in a star of crystal upon the carpet. A few feet from it lay what looked like a long knife or short sword, straight but with an ornamental and pictured handle. Its dull blaze just caught a grey glint from the dreary window behind, which showed the black trees against the leaden level of the sea. Towards the opposite corner of the room was rolled a gentleman's silk top hat, as if it had just been knocked off his head. So much so, indeed, that one almost looked to see if it's still rolling. And in the corner behind it, thrown like a sack of potatoes, but corded like a railway trunk, lay Mr. James Todd Hunter, with a scarf across his mouth, and six or seven ropes knotted around his elbows and ankles. His brown eyes were alive and shifted alertly. Dr. Orion Hood paused for one instant on the doormat and drank in the whole scene of voiceless violence. Then he stepped swiftly across the carpet, picked up the tall silk hat and gravely put it upon the head of the yet pinioned Todd Hunter. It was so much too large for him that it almost slipped down onto his shoulders. Mr. Glass's hat, said the doctor, returning with it and peering into the inside with a pocket lens. How to explain the absence of Mr. Glass and the presence of Mr. Glass's hat. For Mr. Glass is not a careless man with his clothes. That hat is of a stylish shape and systematically brushed and burnished, though not very new. An old dandy, I should think. 
Good, good heavens, called out Miss McNabb. Aren't you going to untie the man first? I say old with intention, though not with certainty, continued the expositor. My reason for it might seem a little far-fetched. The hair of human beings falls out in varying degrees, but almost always falls out slightly. And with the lens I should see the tiny hairs of a hat recently worn. It has none, which leads me to guess that Mr. Glass is bald. Now, when this is taken with the high-pitched and querulous voice which Miss McNabb described so vividly, patience, my dear lady, patience, when we take the hairless head together with the tone common in senile anger, I should think we may deduce some advance in years. Nevertheless, he was probably vigorous and was almost certainly tall. I might rely in some degree on the story of his previous appearance at the window as a tall man in a silk hat, but I think I have more exact indication. This wine glass has been smashed all over the place, but one of its splinters lies on the high bracket beside the mantelpiece. No such fragments could have fallen there if the vessel had been smashed in the hand of a comparatively short man like Mr. Todhunter. Um, by the way, said Father Brown, might it not be as well to untie Mr. Todhunter? Our lesson from the drinking vessels does not end here, proceeded the specialist. I may say at once that it is possible that the man Glass was bald or nervous through dissipation rather than age. Mr. Todd Hunter, it has been remarked, is quite a thrifty gentleman, essentially an abstainer. These cards and wine cups are no part of his normal habit. They have been produced for a particular companion. But, as it happens, we may go farther. Mr. Todd Hunter may or may not possess this wine service, but there is no appearance of his possessing any wine. What, then, were these vessels to contain? I would at once suggest some sort of brandy or whisky, perhaps of a luxurious sort, from a flask in the pocket of Mr. Glass. We have thus something like a picture of the man, or at least of the type, tall, elderly, fashionable, but somewhat frayed, somewhat fond of play and strong waters, perhaps rather too fond of them. Mr. Glass is a gentleman not unknown on the fringes of society. Look here cried the young woman. If you don't let me pass to untie him, I shall run outside and scream for the police. I should not advise you, Miss McNabb, said Dr. Hood gravely, to be any hurry to fetch the police. Father Brown, I seriously ask you to compose your flock for their sakes, not mine. Well, we have seen something of the figure and quality of Mr. Glass. What are the chief facts known of Mr. Todd Hunter? They are substantially three that he is economical, that he is more or less wealthy, and that he has a secret. Now, surely it is obvious that there are the three chief marks of the kind of man who is blackmailed. And surely it is equally obvious that the faded finery, the profligate habits, and the shrill irritation of Mr. Glass are the unmistakable marks of the kind of man who blackmails him. We have the two typical figures of a tragedy of hush money. On the one hand, the respectable man with a mystery. On the other hand, the West End vulture with a scent for a mystery. These two men have met here today and have quarrelled, using blows and a bare weapon. Are you going to take those ropes off? asked the girl stubbornly. Dr. Hood replaced the silk hats carefully on the side table and went across to the captive. He studied him intently, even moving him a little and half turning him round by the shoulders, but only answered, No, I think these ropes will do very well to your friends the police bring their handcuffs. Father Brown, who had been looking dully at the carpet, lifted his round face and said, What do you mean? The man of science had picked up the peculiar dagger sword from the carpet and was examining it intently as he answered. Because you find Mr. Todd Hunter tied up, he said, you all jump to the conclusion that Mr. Glass had tied him up, and then, I suppose, escaped. There are four objections to this. First, 
Why should a gentleman so dressy as our friend Glass leave his hat behind him if he left of his own free will? Second, he continued, moving towards the window, this is the only exit, and it is locked on the inside. Third, this blade here has a tiny touch of blood at the point, but there is no wound on Mr. Todd Hunter. Mr. Glass took that wound away with him, dead or alive. And to all this primary probability, it is much more likely that the blackmailed person should try and kill his incubus rather than that the blackmailer should try and kill the goose that lays his golden egg. There, I think, we have a pretty complete story. But the ropes, inquired the priest, whose eyes had remained open with a rather vacant admiration. Ah, the ropes, said the expert with a singular intonation. Miss McNabb very much wanted to know why I did not set Mr. Todhunter free from his ropes. Well, I will tell her. I did not do it because Mr. Todd Hunter can set himself free from them at any minute he chooses. What? cried the audience in quite different notes of astonishment. I have looked at all the knots on Mr. Todd Hunter, reiterated Hood quietly. I happen to know something about knots. They are quite a branch of criminal science. Every one of those knots he has made himself and could loosen himself. Not one of them would have been made by an enemy really trying to pinion him. The whole of this affair of ropes is a clever fake to make us think him the victim of the struggle instead of the wretched glass whose corpse may be hidden in the garden or stuffed up in the chimney. There was a rather depressed silence. The room was darkening. The sea-blighted boughs of the garden trees looked leaner and blacker than ever, yet they seemed to have come nearer to the window. One could almost fancy they were sea monsters like krakens or cuttlefish, writhing polypi who had crawled up from the sea to see the end of this tragedy, even as he, the villain and victim of it, the terrible man in the tall hat, had once crawled up from the sea. For the whole air was dense with the morbidity of blackmail, which is the most morbid of human things, because it is a crime concealing a crime, a black plaster on a blacker wound. The face of the little Catholic priest, which was commonly complacent and even comic, has suddenly become knotted with a curious frown. It was not the blank curiosity of his first innocence. It was rather that creative curiosity which comes when a man has the beginnings of an idea. Say it again, please, he said in a simple, bothered manner. Do you mean that Todd Hunter can tie himself up all alone and untie himself all alone? That is what I mean, said the doctor. Jerusalem! cried Brown suddenly. I wonder if it could possibly be that. He scuttled across the room, rather like a rabbit, and peered with quite new impulsiveness into the partially covered face of the captive. Then he turned his own rather fatuous face to the company. Yes, that's, that's it, he cried in a certain excitement. Can't you see it in the man's face? Why, look at his eyes. Both the professor and the girl followed the direction of his glance, and though the broad black scarf completely masked the lower half of Tot Hunter's visage, they did grow conscious of something struggling and intense about the upper part of it. His eyes do look queer, cried the young woman, strongly moved. You brutes! I believe it's hurting him! Not that, I think, said Dr. Hood. The eyes certainly have a singular expression, but I should interpret those transverse wrinkles as expressing rather such slight psychological abnormality. A oh, bosh! cried Father Brown. Can't you see? He's laughing! Laughing? repeated the doctor with a start. But what on earth can he be laughing at? Well, replied the Reverend Brown apologetically, not to put too fine a point on it, I think he's laughing at you. And indeed, I'm a little inclined to laugh at myself, now that I know about it. Now that you know about what? asked Hood in some exasperation. Now that I know, replied the priest, the profession of Mr. Todd Hunter. 
He shuffled about the room, looking at one object after another with what seemed to be a vacant stare, and then invariably bursting into an equally vacant laugh, a highly irritating process for those who had to watch it. He laughed very much over the hat, still more uproariously over the broken glass, but the blood on the sword point sent him into mortal convulsions of amusement. Then he turned to the fuming specialist. Dr. Hood, he cried enthusiastically, you are a great poet. You have called an uncreated being out of the void. How much more godlike that is than if you had only ferreted out the mere facts. <laughs> Indeed, the mere facts are rather commonplace and comic by comparison. I have no notion what you are talking about, said Dr. Hood rather haughtily. My facts are all inevitable, though necessarily incomplete. A place may be permitted to intuition, perhaps, or poetry, if you prefer the term, but only because the corresponding details cannot as yet be ascertained in the absence of Mr. Glass. That's it, that's it, said the little priest, nodding quite eagerly. That's the first idea to get fixed, the absence of Mr. Glass. He is so extremely absent. I suppose, he added reflectively, that there is never anybody so absent as Mr. Glass. Do you mean he's absent from the town, demanded the doctor? I mean he is absent from everywhere, answered Father Brown. He is absent from the nature of things. So, so to speak. Do you seriously mean, said the specialist with a smile, that there is no such person? The priest made a sign of assent. It does seem a pity, he said. Orion Hood broke into a contemptuous laugh. Well, he said, before we go on to the hundred and one other evidences, let us take the first proof we found, the first fact we fell over when we fell into this room. If there is no Mr. Glass, whose hat is this? It's Mr. Todd Hunter's, replied Father Brown. But it doesn't even fit him, cried Hood impatiently. He couldn't possibly wear it. Father Brown shook his head with ineffable mildness. I never said that he could wear it, he answered. I said it was his hat. Or, if you insist on a shade of difference, a hat that is his. "'And what is this shade of difference?' asked the criminologist with a slight sneer. "'My good sir,' cried the mild little man, with his first movement akin to impatience, "'if you will walk down the street to the nearest hatter's shop, "'you will see that there is, in common speech, a difference between a man's hat and the hats that are his.' "'But a hatter,' protested Hood, "'can get money out of his stock of new hats.' What would Todd Hunter get out of this one old hat? Rabbits, replied Father Brown promptly. What? cried Dr. Hood. Rabbits, ribbons, sweetmeats, goldfish, rolls of coloured paper, said the reverend gentleman with rapidity. Didn't you see it all when you found out the faked ropes? It's just the same with the sword. Mr. Todd Hunter hasn't a scratch on him, as you say, but he's got a scratch in him, if you follow me. "'Do you mean inside Mr. Todd Hunter's clothes?' inquired Miss McNabb sternly. "'I do not mean inside Mr. Todd Hunter's clothes,' said Father Brown. "'I mean inside Mr. Todd Hunter.' "'What in the name of Bedlam do you mean?' "'Mr. Todd Hunter,' explained Father Brown placidly, "'is learning to be a professional conjurer, "'as well as a juggler, ventriloquist, and expert in the rope trick. "'The conjuring explains the hat.' It is without traces of hair, not because it is worn by the prematurely bald Mr. Glass, but because it has never been worn by anybody. The juggling explains the three glasses, which Todd Hunter was teaching himself to throw up and catch in rotation. But being only at the stage of practice, he smashed one glass against the ceiling. And the juggling also explains the sword which it was Mr. Todd Hunter's professional pride and duty to swallow, but again, being at the stage of practice, he very slightly grazed the inside of his throat with the weapon. Hence, he has a wound inside him, which I am sure, from the expression on his face, is not a serious one. He is also practising the trick of a release from ropes, like the Davenport brothers, and he was just about to free himself when we all burst into the room. 
The cards, of course, are for card tricks, and they are scattered on the floor because he had just been practising one of those dodges of sending them flying through the air. He merely kept his trade secrets because he had to keep his tricks secret like any other conjurer. But the mere fact of an idler in a top hat having once looked in his back window and been driven away by him with great indignation was enough to set us all on the wrong track of romance and make us imagine his whole life overshadowed by the silk-hatted spectre of Mr. Glass. But what about the two voices? asked Maggie, staring. Haven't you ever heard of a ventriloquist? asked Father Brown. Don't you know they speak first in their natural voice and then answer themselves in just that shrill, squeaky, unnatural voice that you heard? There was a long silence, and Dr. Hood regarded the little man who had spoken with a dark and attentive smile. You are certainly a very ingenious person, he said. It could not have been done better in a book. But there is just one part of Mr. Glass that you have not succeeded in explaining away, and that is his name. Miss McNabb distinctly heard him addressed so by Mr. Todd Hunter. The Reverend Mr. Brown broke into a rather childish giggle. Well, that, he said, is the silliest part of the whole silly story. When our juggling friend here threw up the three glasses in turn, he counted them aloud as he caught them, and also commented aloud uh, when he failed to catch them. Uh, what he really said was, one, two, three, missed a glass, one, two, missed a glass, and so on. There was a second of stillness in the room, and then everyone with one accord burst out laughing. As they did so, the figure in the corner complacently uncoiled all the ropes and let them fall with a flourish. Then, advancing into the middle of the room with a bow, he produced from his pocket a big bill printed in red and blue, which announced that Zaladin, the world's greatest conjurer, contortionist, ventriloquist and human kangaroo would be ready with an entirely new series of tricks at the Empire Pavilion Scarborough on Monday next at eight o'clock precisely. End of The Absence of Mr Glass Read by Wear Tortoise, Manchester, UK, 27th December 2022